academia hear that I'm writing about cream cheese, right? They like, like your reaction. Everyone just bursts into laughter, right? <laughs> All of my rabbinic colleagues are writing books on Bible studies, and, right, right? And here I am with cream cheese. So I want to start for a moment to explain why this is a serious topic of, of study, and then uh, we'll get into the actual history. Now, Miri and I know we're, we're pushing the envelope just a little bit to try and figure out how cream cheese works directly into Yiddish culture. Right? Um, actually, uh, the fourth article I'm working on now, and Miri's been helping me a little bit, I, I've needed to look at cream cheese advertising in um, uh, uh, the uh, Morgan uh, Journal and the Forbes. So I'm looking at um, how uh, advertising uh, uh, went in the Yiddish press in uh, New York City at the turn of the century. Anyway, but that's a side piece. So, uh, how to begin? Over the last 10, 15 years, uh, Jewish historians have been looking very carefully at the myth of um, Jewish upper mobility in America. Uh, the way the story goes is, uh, especially for the Eastern European immigrants, they came to America, they settled on the Lower East Side of New York, and through the famous uh, uh, Yiddish cup, right, their, their brains, they quickly rose up in society, and by the second generation, um, they had made successes of themselves, right? The, the garment workers slaving away night after night, day after day, their children became doctors and lawyers and professors. While all around us, when we look at the other immigrant groups, they simply didn't do as well. Clearly, it was due to our Jewish brains. Well, maybe more. Maybe the skills we acquired in Eastern Europe, sort of as Luft mentioned, right? Sort of managing to exist in between jobs and somehow figuring out how to make a living. Right? That's been the operative myth. Over the last decade and a half, Jewish historians have now been focusing on, is that true? And really, how did Jews actually get from rags to riches? And so for the first time, uh, there have been some serious studies looking into this. Uh, mostly, by the way, focused on uh, the garment trade, um, the rag trade, so to speak, um, movie making, uh, phonograph, the phonograph and the, and the record um, uh, industry, uh, which is also very interesting. Um, but no one's been looking at uh, the food industry, which is where I come in, but that's a little later. So uh, it turns out, as we start reading these examinations, that it has nothing to do with our intelligence. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah, well. I mean, we can't, you know, it's good to have it, but that's not the reason why we made it and other ethnic groups did not do as well. Specifically, when I say other ethnic groups, I'm talking in code, I'm talking about the Italians. <laughs> <laughs> not the Irish? Um, I mean, Irish too, but Irish was, was a uh, early, earlier immigration. Um, and yes, it is true when we compare the German Jews with, with the Irish, Right, and the later Irish with uh, with the Jews, none of them did as well. Okay, so why? Um, the first reason is the Jews were here to stay. Um, a huge percentage of Italians who came over were Italian young men who came here to make enough money so they could go back to Italy with the money and be able to find a, a bride and and start and start a, li a living. A lot of them were simply here just to make enough money to bring with them, and that was the end of the story. As you well know, for our ancestors, there was no one who was going back to uh, uh, Russia. Not for a moment. We were here to stay. Second, we came here with um, family members. Uh, uh, compared to the other immigrant groups, again, we have families coming over. Now, initially, it was true, oftentimes the sons would come over, or in a lot of cases, the daughter, the older daughters would come over, but they would work long enough and hard enough to bring the rest of the family with them. Now, the disadvantages to bringing the family over means you have more mouths to feed. 
harder to feed a group of three, four, six, seven, however many eventually come over, than it is if you're a solitary individual. However, um, it works out better in the long run. As the kids grow and are capable of taking on work themselves, they no longer become a burden, but rather the income they're bringing in is larger than what the family is consuming. So it turns out that family units are a real key to success. But if family units are a real key to success, what does it mean that children can't be doing as they get older? Going to school. Going to school. It turns out that the Jewish dropout rate for kids was enormous. As soon as they could get working papers at the age of 12, 12 and a half, they did so and dropped out of school. The majority of Jews did not go on to college, graduate school, and the like. That's going to have to wait to the third generation. Hmm. Okay? Instead, the kids go right to work, and that's helpful. Uh, Landsmannschaften, uh, uh, the different uh, uh, Jewish um, uh, community groups or some of the self-help uh, and aid groups were useful, but not necessarily for the earliest immigrants. So we, we give some credit towards them, that Jews were able to find help from other Jews. Um, but in terms of an organized Jewish community, especially from about 1880 uh, to 1890, not that organized. Not that organized. Um, nonetheless, we, uh, we do think that patterns of um, a communal solidarity helped. We find that for Jews who go into business, who do they employ in their business but their family members, their immediate family members, their cousins, and then other people from the shtetl. That's helpful as well in, in helping them to uh, move into a new uh, uh, status. Uh, so, in investigating these different factors and how they played out in the world of economics to contribute to the Jewish um, rise, um, the fact is, is that almost no one has studied food and the food industry as a way to get ahead as well. So about 10 years ago, I decided to do a micro study to take one example, Breakstone Brothers Dairy. Those of you who are from New York, right? Yeah, <laughs> famous. Uh, I decided to do a history of Brickstone Brothers to examine exactly how did they do it. What were the factors that enabled Joe and Ike Brickstone to come off the boat from Lithuania and to uh, make themselves an enormous success? Um, and in doing so, um, I came across a startling statement from members of the Breakstone family and people who had been involved uh, in, in the manufacture of dairy products. Their claim was that Breakstone Brothers had actually introduced cream cheese to America. And now I'm thinking, whoa, I'm on now. Not only do I have an economic study, I, I, this is going to be great. I'm going to show the, the, the enormous impact that this dairy had on American eating habits as well. So I investigate a little further, and it turns out, no, no, they didn't. No, cream cheese was here before, and... Well, no one knew exactly who created it, so I decided I'd have to investigate just a little bit so I could at least have a good footnote to say, no, this is not true. Instead, cream cheese was invented in X and X year by so-and-so. Ten years later, I finished the footnote. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got into cream cheese. <laughs> So um, what I'm going to be um, uh, sharing with you today is uh, really a summary of two articles that I've written, one on the creation of cream cheese and the second on advertising and distribution. And the story really will impact us um, because in the process it'll help um, explode a couple of, uh, of myths as well. So let's begin. What about locks? Oh, that's all. I'll, at the end, as we get to the end, I'll talk about the issue of bagel, cream cheese, and lox. Okay? Um, the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, this.
this is, this is the Holy Trinity. <laughs> Roger Bittman. <laughs> Mark, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Bittman, uh, uh, New York, uh, uh, wrote in the New York Times, is a great uh, 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 cook and uh, cookbook uh, creator. He, he called it the Holy Trinity of Judaism, bagels, lox, and cream cheese. Um, <laughs> but I'll say one thing about it right now just to whet your appetite, so to speak. When do you think bagels, lox, and cream cheese came together as a Jewish food? 20s or 30s? Early 20s. Well, I'll take, I'll take some answers. Okay, 20, I hear 20s. Early 20th century. Early 20th century. So, so like uh, 1905, 10, 6, 10, yeah. something like that. Later. Much later. 1940. 40s. 20s. 20s. Do I hear? 1930s. 30s, all right. All right, we got to cover it. The price is right. Okay. The earliest mention so far I can find is 1945. Yeah. It's really, really late. Really late. And if we have time, why it is, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. That's going to be the subject of my fourth article, but we're getting there. Okay. All right. So, um, the Jewish myth is, now to go back to uh, uh, cream cheese, <laughs> is that in Eastern Europe, in the shtetl, what did we do? But we danced around all day, we sang, and we ate bagels and cream cheese. Mm, no. <laughs> no. Um, uh, it turns out when we look at um, all records of life in Eastern Europe, when we look at cookbooks, when we look at um, anecdotal literature of people writing their biographies about growing up, etc., it turns out in Eastern Europe there was no cream cheese. Borscht. Well, that's nice, but try putting borscht on a bagel. <laughs> Uh, got a soggy mess. There was no cream cheese in Eastern Europe. Jews had never seen cream cheese, tasted cream cheese, until they came to America. That's the first thing. Um, so why? Uh, I don't have my tub. Okay. In order to understand why, um, we have to uh, take a few uh, moments uh, to talk about uh, dairy production. Okay, now I, I promise it'll be easy. If I can understand this, uh, you can understand this as well. We start with a cow. Yes. <laughs> and what we're going to do is milk the cow and get a glass of milk. A glass of fresh milk from a cow. We are going to set it outside overnight. And what is going to happen overnight is the fat globulins that are in the milk naturally, which tend, by the way, to be light, they will float to the top. Float to the top. We'll let it cool under the moon. And in the morning, we will skim it off. And what we'll end up with is cream. So by simply setting a glass of milk outside, <laughs> The cream rises to the top. Isn't that an expression right? in English too, right? right? Cream rises to the top. Um, we'll take this cream that we've gotten. Oh, by the way, when you've skimmed the cream from the top, what's left of the milk? Skimmed, skimmed milk. milk. Skimmed milk. Okay. All right. But well, let's take our container of cream and put it to the side. All right. Now we come to the magic ingredient, rennet. Rennet is taken from the dried fourth stomach, more than you want to know, of an unweaned calf. Yeah. Its purpose of rennet, just a little tiny piece of this, is it curdles milk. When you curdle milk, all it means is the milk now clumps together into curds. Kosher, yeah, it's perfectly kosher. I'll talk about why it is in a minute. Oh, why aren't we mixing milk and meat? I can see you're wondering. We'll come back to that. Keep that in mind, okay? Uh, yes, it is. So, we take a drop of rennet. We drop it into the milk, and magically the milk curdles up. Most of the liquid now comes together and clumps. And what we have is cottage cheese. That's how you make cottage cheese. Cottage cheese. 
Hmm? Farmer's cheese. Farmer's cheese. Well, cheese. not quite. So we have to do one more thing to get farmer's cheese. Let's we'll see if we get it. Okay. When you squeeze the cottage cheese, it's still pretty soft and liquidy. When you squeeze it, the liquid that comes out is called whey. No. Like curds and whey. <laughs> and now you understand little Miss Muffet. <laughs> Remember, she sat. On, I don't know what a tough it is. I don't want to know, but she sits on her. Must be Yiddish for something, right? No. She sits on her tuffet. What is she eating? Her curds. That's the curdled milk and the whey, the liquid that's been squeezed out. You're now experts on Little Miss Muffet. So let's take it from the top, shall we? Let's take a glass of milk. Let's throw in a little bit of rennet. Let's get cottage cheese all clumped up. Let's squeeze it and squeeze it. And now what we have is soft cheese like farmer cheese. In other words, farmer cheese is just cottage cheese with more of the liquid squeezed out. All right. Now catch this. So now we've squeezed out all the liquid. We have this soft farmer cheese. Let's add the cream that we had over at the side oh. to this soft cheese. Pour it in, stir it around. Cream cheese. <laughs> and we have cream cheese. Voila. Voila. We have cream cheese. <laughs> um, and now we begin perhaps to understand just a little bit why Jews in Eastern Europe did not have cream cheese. The answer is it's a very rich, expensive cheese to make. At a time when oftentimes in the shtetl not everyone had a cow, milk was at a premium. You're lucky if you could get some. You certainly don't have enough uh, milk supply to, to uh, be able to skim off cream and mix it in with, no, you don't have any of that. Um, as a result, it, it's, it's the equivalent of, of living in poverty and saying, well, I think I'd like some brie. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen. So Jews in Eastern Europe had no um, uh, uh, contact with cream cheese. Now, uh, to give you an idea of how I spend my time, this is the uh, new Philadelphia cream cheese containers, by the way. I don't know if you've noticed they've changed shape. Yeah, they've changed shape for stacking purposes. They stack much better like this. Um, but what's most interesting is what is written on the, um, the container since 1872. They're wrong, but they're not far off. Okay. Um, uh, cream cheese uh, uh, gets introduced into America about 1875. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So even before Eastern European Jews are coming off the boat, there is already cream cheese in America. And by the way, parenthetically, and I'll talk about this in a little bit as well, once Jews arrive here in America, they're still not eating cream cheese. <laughs> We'll talk about why in a few minutes. All right. So in order to understand cream cheese, we now have to move into Yankee territory. <laughs> By the way, the earliest cream cheese advertised in the Yiddish press so far is Yankee cream cheese. Yeah. <laughs> just, just terrific. All right. So let's talk about um, how we get cream cheese. So like most foods, cream cheese does not arrive de novo, um, uh, from, from nothing, right? It, all food sort of gets developed from recipes and things that have, have, have been before. Um, the earliest mention we have of something akin to cream cheese has to do with recipes in, um, uh, in uh, probably about 1500s in England of a dish called Unfortunately, junk it. In essence, it's curdled cream. It's cream in which you drop some rennet in. It causes it to clump together. You add a little bit of rose water for sweetness, and it was a dessert. Later on, the English developed very rich cream cheeses. 
um, cheese is made with a combination of, of milk product and cream product mixed together, and we have Stilton cheese. It is probably mm. the, the closest originator to cream cheese That's we have. Okay. The French will develop Neufchatel. Yeah. Okay. Again, these are cheeses made with cream um, that's curdled. Now, when the English settlers come here uh, to America, they bring with them these basic formulas for curdling cream and making what indeed they call cream cheeses. Not our cream cheese, but cream cheeses. Um, primarily, you curdle the cream, um, you um, uh, squeeze out a good chunk of the whey that's left, and you have this soft little puddle of uh, uh, cheese uh, uh, that uh, you uh, let sit in a, in a bag for a couple weeks to um, cure and harden a little bit, and now you have your cream cheeses. They are mostly being uh, made by uh, uh, colonial uh, farmer wives, especially in and around the Philadelphia area. Uh, well, there's a connection there. We'll come back to that. Yes. But it turns out Philadelphia cream cheese, not made in Philadelphia. <laughs> Go figure. Go figure. Um, so in the um, uh, late um, 1700s and early 1800s, we have recipes being published in all sorts of uh, newspapers for the farm wife, giving her advice of how to make cream cheeses. Okay. Again, same thing, get the rennet, drop it in, let it curdle, squeeze out some liquid, add some salt, let it sit, life is perfect. <laughs> um, the area around Philadelphia, as I said, develops, the farmers develop a reputation for creating these cream cheese. And visitors from New York City would go down to Philadelphia and then would come back with, with, to their friends with stories about the wonderful cream cheeses they had while they were there. Now, cream cheese was not shipped. You had to go down to Philadelphia to get it because it's a highly perishable product. It's not like the hard cheeses. It's not like the cheddars that, for example, we find in the Midwest. It's a soft cheese. It means it spoils. Why don't you put it in the fridge? Yeah. <laughs> there are no fridges. Um, ice is not yet being mass manufactured. There's no way to keep this stuff um, uh, cold enough to ship from Philadelphia to New York. Now, some people tried it. Uh, stagecoach. Um, uh, the express stagecoach, which is the most expensive. I mean, you guys have tried shipping like overnight packages. You know, it's like $800 for an envelope, you know, to do it immediately overnight. Express stagecoach was like that as well. Enormously expensive to pay for. And it took a full day and a half for the express stagecoach to get from Philadelphia to New York. Chances of the cheese surviving, very small. Um, uh, Winter? Well, I know some of you are thinking winter. Yes, but cows aren't producing milk in winter. So what is going to have to wait for New Yorkers especially to start sampling cream cheeses is first going to be steamboats, and then is really going to be the rail system. Uh, question here, yeah. Yeah, and my comment was that those things that you said about it spoils is another way of saying aged cheese. Well, no, there is a difference between, how should we put it, aging gracefully and spoiling gracefully. What's um, the difference? <laughs> Do I really want to touch that? I don't know. Oh, a cheese. Um, uh, 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 rancid. Um, uh, uh, it's blue. Yeah. It, 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 um, it rots. It rots rather than it. I like blue cheese. No, blue cheese is great. Blue cheese is aged cheese. The, um, the hard cheeses are simply able to slowly develop. It's like, um, it's like wine, right? You can age wine, it slowly changes its composition. Or you can have vinegar, right? Which is spoiled wine. Cheese works the same way. Certain cheeses are meant. Um, uh, they have almost no liquid in them, uh, so it's much easier for them to last for a period of time. But cream cheese, you still got a fair amount of, of, uh, of you got cream, you got milk, um, you got to keep it cold. And it's got to hit to the consumers within a day to two after you make it. 
very quick delivery time. So, for a while, cream cheese is being uh, kept on the farms around Philadelphia. And when New York farmers in upstate New York are also experimenting with it through these recipes, they too can't ship it to New York City. It has to remain a local farm product. What's going to change? Well, the railroad system. The uh, creation of refrigeration. Well, the first thing they did once the railroad system came is during the summer, um, uh, the farmers at least could ship milk down to, uh, to New York City. They'd immerse the milk in cans in cold spring water near their farms, and then rush it to the train depot in their town, and hope that the train got to New York within five or six hours, and they could pull it off, um, and it could be ladled out. The problem, again, is by even getting it off the train, then it's got to sit there, be picked up by wagons, go to local distributors, doled out to local merchants, mm, spoiled milk, spoiled milk. But with the advent of ice, we're done. We can refrigerate cars. We can ship with ease. And that's one of the key factors that is now going to make cream cheese production and shipping possible. The other thing that's going to make it possible is the steam engine. We forget how great is the steam engine. It's the equivalent of, for us, batteries. Right? I mean, think about it. Think about how much we take for granted having a pack of batteries around that we can simply slide in for the flashlights, the, the portable radios, the right, you name it. Right? Um, the steam engine for manufacturers worked the same. All of a sudden, you got a steam engine that not only powers the big stuff, the, you know, the, the trains and the locomotives and the big steel mills and all of that, but now for the first time, they're making mom and pop steam engines. And you can get a, buy a steam engine and put it on your farm, and suddenly you can start mass producing stuff. Uh, by the way, shall we add the garment industry? The same thing. We go from having to hand sew and hand stitch everything to um, uh, uh, steam, uh, steam-driven um, uh, uh, presses. Um, so the steam engine changes manufacturing in America. And what it does, it creates mass production. Um, uh, before, you had to like, um, you could, you'd hand press one cheese at a time really slowly to, to get the, the liquid out. Now you could set a row of 12 cheeses out and you have what they call a gang press, which is this big gigantic press driven by steam that presses down and uniformly presses at the same time. And, and suddenly you can produce 12 cheeses at the same time when you only had one. Cool. And finally, um, We've got almost all the factors in place now by about 1870. We have a rail system, we've got ice manufacture, we've got steam engines. We also need to have a taste for cheese. Because let's be clear, if, you're, if you get this great idea in your head like, oh, I think I'll make, uh, I don't know, what's the stinkiest cheese around? Limburg, any of you ever had Limburger cheese? It's an acquired taste, it really is. Or, um, Camembert. Camembert. Camembert, some people a little too too strong for. Uh, um, or or I don't know. Growing up, my, my grandmother used to used to serve us liverwurst. Uh, uh, what was that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have no. I, I do, and I don't want to know to this day. It's this gooky stuff. And right. Uh, God. Okay. So the other factor that it, 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 this depends on is having the right type of cheese. So up to now, for American tastes in the, um, at the end of the 1700s and the early 1800s, we have English tastes. For the most part, we're settled by uh, colonial settles, settlers from, from England, and we have their kinds of cheeses. But suddenly, uh, and this begins right after the, right after the Revolutionary um, uh, War, um, uh, we begin to have an appreciation for things French. And by about the 1840s in America, among the upper class, there's a mania for French food. This is the time that sees for the first time the French restaurant opening up in New York City, right? Um, and for the first time, Americans get tastes of French soft cheeses, of Camembert, 
um, a Brie um, Neufchatel. Hmm. And we start seeing advertisements in newspapers as they, it, it's so interesting to look at, at, at newspapers from the um, late 1800s. Not only do they report on like the fancy dinner that was given by uh, uh, so-and-so, they give you the whole menu. The reporters give the readers the whole menu. And of course, these are the days when they serve like 12 courses. Right? You've seen those pictures of the silverware from those yeah. times. There's more forks than you can ever, right? There's the salad fork and the fish fork and the knife fork and the thing that's in front of right, right, okay. Um, so they report on all the food that's eaten. And at the end of the meal, always, there's a fancy French cheese or two. Then you have hotels, expensive hotels in New York that advertise um, um, a special holiday dinners that they're giving. And, you know, we can still do that today. And once again, French cheeses are on the menu. We start to look at books for hostesses of how to throw parties. And now, not for the upper class, but for the aspiring middle class, suddenly there's this notion that French cheeses are something to really impress and amaze your friends at your dinner soiree. <laughs> so there now starts to become a market for French cheese, soft French cheese, at exactly the time there's the ability to produce it, ship it, keep it cool. It all comes together wonderfully in 1870. That's when William Lawrence, who's an upstate New York farmer, becomes our first manufacturer of cheese, of cream cheese in America. Well, hmm. actually he starts out developing Neufchatel cheese. Well, actually before then. <laughs> Lawrence is a great story. He's um, generations of, of, of farmers. His family is dirt poor. He doesn't even have a farm growing up. He's forced to hire himself out as a farm hand. Now, in the farming world, there is really no one lower than a farmhand. The farmhand is, is your laborer who comes in, does the work. Sometimes you'll give them a place to sleep in the barn, and that's it. They spend their day working, they get their daily wages, they'll grow old, and they'll die. That's the story of, of being a farmhand. So, um, Lawrence is a farmhand. Um, he works for a local widower who has two grown daughters. <laughs> and one of the daughters falls in love with Lawrence, the farmhand. And he marries the daughter. And when her father dies, Lawrence inherits the farm! Yeah. <laughs> he now becomes overnight a gentleman farmer. Huge expanse of land. And Lawrence decides to experiment with making cheese. There is a um, Neufchatel uh, cheese producer in Chester, New York, where Lawrence lives, who doesn't know how to make cheese, soon goes out of business. Lawrence buys the equipment and starts making Neufchatel cheese. Um, now, Neufchatel cheese, uh, in essence, is, um, uh, is pretty much milk that's been curdled. Um, squeezed out, and the signature form that the French make Neufchatel cheese in is round logs. They're round. And they're aged, sometimes for several, not spoiled, they're aged for several <laughs> months. Right? The American version is real simple. The American cheese producers can't figure out how the French make it. All they know is it has to look round, <laughs> and it should be soft. So what they're doing is making these round logs of squeezed out uh, uh, milk cheese, uh, which gets labeled Neufchatel and gets sent out. So Lawrence is uh, busy making uh, Neufchatel. Let's see if we got a picture of our boy here. Here's our man. Here's William A. Lawrence. Not, uh, not quite. Not, not not happened to him. Come on, guy. There we are. Yeah, we are. Here's William A. Lawrence um, in his um, heyday. Gone is the farm boy. Um, he ends up owning property all over Chester, New York. Um, two racehorses. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He he is he. Uh, uh, he makes it and becomes the mayor of the town as well. This oh, is wow. this is a success story writ, writ large. So this is William A. <laughs> Lawrence in his... Uh, oh, from one woman. Huh? From one woman. <laughs> Good woman behind every man. Okay. 
Uh, here. Okay, just to show you, Nuf Chantel Mold. Uh, Lawrence begins very, uh, very small and very modest, about 200 rolls a day. That's not a big production if you think about it, right? Um, uh, the uh, 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 the uh, rolls are put in, in uh, boxes and shipped down to New York to be, uh, to be sold. In uh, 1877, uh, in order to distinguish his product, um, uh, well, let me wait on that for a second. Uh, in 18, late 1874, early 1875, Lawrence is approached by a um, New York um, Fine Foods Emporium. Uh, I'm trying to think of the equivalent that we have today. Well, look, look, for, for those of you in New York know like about Zabar's, right? Or Roos and Daughter, right? We don't, do we have anything like that in LA? I don't know. We will. Dean and DeLuca, that's right. Dean and DeLuca, right. DeLuca is as close as we get. Okay. He's, uh, he's approached by the owners of the, of the uh, local Dean and DeLuca, who are selling his Neufchatel cream cheese, and they say to him, you know, this is going well, but we're wondering, can you produce for us a cheese with a higher milk fat co content? In other words, right now, Neufchatel is about 4% milk fat, can you do better than that? So Lawrence goes back to the farm, fools around. He's a dairy man. He knows the one thing that even we all know, cream in anything is terrific, <laughs> right? I mean, what's the difference? You all know this. Try pouring skim milk into your cup of coffee in the, in the morning and try pouring in half and half for cream, right? I mean, let's be clear, it's, it's heavenly, right? Um, so Lawrence experiments a little bit. He says, okay, if I'm gonna do this, clearly I've gotta make a mixture, then I've gotta add more cream. Let me see if I can figure out uh, how to do this. He monkeys around with it for a couple months and then creates a product, an offshoot of Neufchatel, but with cream in it. He calls it cream cheese. And he starts shipping it down to the uh, Emporium in New York and they love it. And cream cheese for the first time by 1875 is, is launched in America. That's why I said Kraft is closed, they claim 1872, which is probably when Lawrence went into cheese production with Neufchatel, but not cream cheese. Um, in Lawrence's later years, parenthetically, whenever he's interviewed, um, the date that he gives for when he invented cream cheese, it gets earlier and earlier and earlier. <laughs> But looking at records, it's clear um, 1875 is, 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 is the year. Is it possible that the Kraft date is saying that's the origins of Kraft? No. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Um, uh, Kraft is much later. Um, and uh, no, they Kraft even got uh, Breakstone Brothers uh, uh, origination date off. No. Okay. But look, again, like any manufacturer, they like to push the date back as early as they, as they could. Um, but uh, they, they, Kraft will claim, when you say to them, they based it on William Lawrence's testimony that he invented it in 1872, but he lied. <laughs> they just don't know he lied, that's it. I mean, they're, they're, they're not deliberately trying to, anyone here from Kraft? No, they're not deliberately trying to deceive us. Um, so uh, by 1875, Lawrence is now churning out Neufchatel and cream cheese, and to distinguish his product, um, uh, especially Neufchatel, from his uh, competitors. Let's see if I have it here. No, I don't think I have. I'm not seeing yet my logo. All right, I'll come up. Hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to show you a, a picture of the... Oh, here it is. There we go. This is the first trademark for cream cheese in America. It's William Lawrence's. Um, Fascinating because he's it's absolutely fascinating. Remember, he's making Neufchatel and cream cheese, but what does he use to put on the side of the boxes? But simply one brand, right? It's got to serve for both. So it's Neufchatel and cream cheese. Both is the earliest earliest trademark for cream cheese in America. Um, now it turns out, by the way, cream cheese is not difficult to make if you're a dairy farmer. Okay, for most of us it is. You gotta watch the amount of salt and the heat and all the other processes, but overall, it's, it's not really a secret. 
Uh, and so what happens is other farmers in the Chester area, the upper New York State area, uh, begin also to manufacture cream cheese um, as well. And again, by uh, 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 1877, Lawrence has to um, issue a brand. Now, to understand what happens next, you have to remember the most famous episode of I Love Lucy. <laughs> The candy factory, right? That wonderful, right? It, it, it's a it's a emblematic moment in film history. The candy is coming off the conveyor belt faster than Lucy can scoop it up and deal with it. Right? That's be what begins to happen with manufacturing throughout America when you take um, the steam engine, which is in essence putting manufacturing on steroids. In other words, you're manufacturing stuff faster than you can figure out what to do with it. Because, the, the, again, the steam engine just churns it out. It keeps churning it out. So Lawrence now begins to have a problem, which is he's making more cream cheese than he knows what to do with. How is he going to distribute it? And here enters the next hero of our stories. <laughs> which is uh, in 1880, Alva Reynolds. Let's see if I have Alva Reynolds. Here's Alva Reynolds. Alva is also a farm boy, um, but he gets off the family farm quickly, and he goes into serving as a middleman um, uh, to do distribution. Because look, if you're a farmer in upstate New York and you're producing this cheese, what do you know about selling it? So you could load it on the back of your wagon and come into New York City. Then what are you going to do? Stand on the street corner? No, you need to find um, uh, uh, local wholesalers to sell it to or local merchants to sell it to. But you're a farmer from upstate New York. You don't know anyone. So what you're dependent on are cheese brokers, are people who'll say to you, look, I'll come take your product, right? Or I'll meet the train when it arrives in New York, or I'll meet the boat as it docks um, uh, on the East River, uh, and I'll see the material is, is unloaded, and then I'll sell it to local merchants. Right? That's, that's what um, uh, Reynolds started to do. He got himself a wagon, um, and he started peddling cheese from, from local, up from, uh, not local, from upstate New York dairy farmers. By the way, James Kraft, who started Kraft, did the exact same thing in Chicago. He started with one horse and a wagon. He went to the cheese manufacturers, and he starts out as a distributor. By the way, Breakstone Brothers, distributors first. That's the way you get your initial entree, okay? distributing other people's products. So Reynolds is looking for a new cheese to peddle, and he approaches Lawrence in 1880. And he says, look, I think I can solve your problem. I'm going to take the cheese off your hands, and I'm going to sell it to not, not just uh, the one emporium in New York. I'm going to sell, them, sell it all over the place. And Lawrence says, great. And now Reynolds, who's really, I think, the, the genius person in this story, he comes up with another idea. He says to Lawrence, look, you're packing these crates filled with cream cheese, and on the side of the crates, it has your, your brand. He said, we've got to do better than that. What we have to do is label every single package of cream cheese that you create. So what we're going to do is we're going to take um, uh, foil wrappers and wrap them around each individual cream cheese, and we're going to print on each wrapper a brand name. All right, so Lawrence, that's great. Let's call it Lawrence's Cream Cheese. <laughs> no, Reynolds said that's not going to work. Reynolds says, you know... Philadelphia, Pennsylvania had this and has this reputation for fine quality cheese. Hmm. Let's call it Philadelphia cream cheese. <laughs> um, um, in addition, um, uh, he decides to call it uh, an Excelsior brand. Uh, Excelsior, by the way, is the motto of the state of New York. 
it means ever higher. It's a great pun because on one level it means this is a superior cream cheese, right? On the other hand, it sort of hints it's actually being produced in New York. And for the label here, it's, right? L C C R. Excelsior. In, in, in. Yeah, isn't that cute? Yeah. Yeah. Great license plate. Is that great? Yeah. The great license plate. Yeah. Um, now, what's fascinating about this is um, a, a couple things. One, notice what's not on this package of cream cheese Lawrence's name. Now, in the early history of advertising in America, what happens is all the manufacturers put their names on their products. Right? Lawrence is one of the earliest um, uh, uh, advertisers not to do so. He says, what does the consumer care that it's made by Lawrence? What do they know about Lawrence? Instead, he said, let's again give it a, a, a great cachet. Let's call it Philadelphia. Everyone has associations with Philadelphia. And we'll call it Excelsior, a high product. And that's how we'll sell it. So Lawrence's name never appears on it. Every now individual wrapped bar of cream cheese um, now bears a, a foil wrapper which says Philadelphia cream cheese. I should mention, by the way, that um, uh, Lawrence does not package the cream cheese in the, in the rolls like Neufchatel, but instead goes into squares. Um, now, the reason for this uh, is not just to distinguish it from Neufchatel, but it turns out in boxes, those of you who learned this in the higher math, uh, you can actually pack more squares in a box than you can round rolled objects in a box. Um, and already this is a foretaste of how um, sales are going to drive the shape of food or the kind of food, right? It will, of course, end up with that wonderful uh, creation of craft called processed cheese, which is <laughs> barely cheese anymore, um, but which has an incredible shelf life. So you can sell it, you can ship it all over the place and sell it uh, anywhere. It anyway, actually yeah. isn't cheese. It's actually, if you look at a package of Velveeta now, it says, a cheese-like food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. Yes. But, but lest we slam craft too much, let's remember when, when it was first produced, this enabled... Um, uh, a cheese to be shipped to the far corners of the world. The military bought tons of this stuff because um, it would keep, it wouldn't spoil. Um, it's great stuff. But yeah, no, it's, it's <laughs> barely cheese. Okay, so um, Reynolds now begins selling the cheese. Um, and he is so successful at peddling it that he now really, he's outstripping um, Lawrence's ability to manufacture it. Reynolds goes to another Chester farmer, a competitor of Lawrence's, Charles Green. And he says to Green, listen, I want to buy cream cheese from you. But there's only one condition. You have to take each individual cheese and wrap it in my labels. Reynolds now has two separate farmers making slightly different formula cream cheese, but he packages it as the same item. After all, what does the consumer know? All they know is they get the same package every time. It says Philadelphia cream cheese, and he's off and running. <coughs> After several years, Lawrence says to himself, you know, if I had a cheese-making facility, I'd do even better. So he ditches Lawrence, he ditches Green, and he starts buying up dairies to produce his own, his own dairy products. Um, he... Uh, uh, buys uh, 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 two or three dairies. Then he approaches Phoenix Dairy Company. Uh, more about that in a minute. And Phoenix is making um, his cheese wrapped in, in, the, in the labels. Um, uh, dairy companies that he owns, probably three or four at a time, are making cream cheese wrapped in his labels. Doesn't matter. That's what he's pushing and selling. In about 1902, Reynolds approaches Kraft Dairy, which is now a conglomerate in America, 
and um, offers them um, uh, his uh, uh, trademark for cream cheese. Kraft buys it. Uh, so Kraft today is the legitimate owner of Philadelphia cream cheese, the first cream cheese manufactured in America, genuine. Um, and uh, Reynolds goes into uh, uh, wealth and retirement in New Jersey, running for political office. That's what people with money do these days, I guess. Uh, running a box company, uh, but he fades out of the the dairy process. So did Lawrence actually not have a registered patent with the Eco's patent? No, no patent. Oh, okay, I mean just just you know, brand the registration. Just okay, but it says name. registered U.S. patent. Yeah, yeah. Uh -uh. And so he just got it's like a copyright. He just got phoned yeah. out of the deal completely. Yeah. Well, again, well, also he because, the because also trademark, but again, but it, it, it's like it's started. like trying to it's like trying to register milk, mm -hmm. right. right? The best you can do is you know create a brand for it and sell it under the brand and, right. and maintain the brand. But again, it's not, cream cheese ultimately is not a but hard product. But Lawrence nobody really owned any of that. Zippo. Wow. Zippo. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And I suspect it may have even been hard to sustain in court too much because you do have different cream cheese recipes, etc., going on. Right. Maybe, maybe. But no, no, never patents the process. Kraft uh, absolutely um, uh, patents the process and vigorously defends it over the years. Right. I mean, huge um, settlements. Uh, the other people creating processed cheese, by the way, next to Kraft is Phoenix company that uh, Reynolds had uh, um, sold out to and what will eventually happen the way they'll settle who owns processed cheese is they'll end up merging in the largest conglomerate that you've ever seen right. so for a long time it's Kraft FedEx or Phoenix okay where are we this cream cheese so I'm, in, I'm getting there yeah, where are the Jews coming in today? right now let's bring let's bring in the Jews enough of these Yankees right enough of this okay so by the time the Jews all right we happy <laughs> By the time the Jews get off the boat in the 18, um, uh, well, not the 1880s, but by the time they're in, in New York by uh, about 1885, 86, there are all sorts of other cream cheese brands on the market. Hooray, Jews finally get to eat cream cheese. No, we don't. <laughs> You have to think of cream cheese like brie, okay? Have to. It was a, still, even in America, it's a rich, expensive cheese to make. And the immigrants coming off the boat can't afford brie and they can't afford cream cheese. So cream cheese does not enter the Jewish diet from at least 1880 to probably after 1900. Okay, they can't afford it. Can't afford it. Um, Excuse me. Yes, do you please. Know the price of milk of that year? No. Okay. But it's a great question. It would be good to. Thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so. Uh, All that will change uh, by the 1920s with two immigrant brothers from Lithuania, Joe and Ike um, Brigstein, right? Who then become Brigstone here in America. They're from a uh, small little town. Uh, it's not even a town. They're from a farm uh, called Padamuchelis, which is um, right outside of Panamunia, which is across the river from Kovno. Okay, let's get ourselves, okay? So we're Lithuania, Kovno, Panamunia. All right. Um, they um, uh, first move to Odessa, uh, then they come uh, uh, to America. They immediately go into peddling, uh, picture frames, fruits and vegetables, and eventually have put aside enough money um, uh, to go into business, each one separately. Joe runs a small grocery store on the Lower East Side of New York. Um, Ike uh, attempts to do milk distribution. Then he starts an ill-fated ice cream company. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, none, but none of that works. In 1897, 
uh, by the way, almost 15 years after uh, Kraft says they did. In 1897, the brothers get together to start Brinkstone Brothers Dairy. They are commission merchants. All they are doing is distributing dairy products from farmers to um, local stores. They're distributing cottage cheese, milk, um, sour cream. Those are their main, their main products. And they will continue doing so, and they will uh, create a very large network of distribution centers. Um, in 1922, 1923, um, they are approached by a, a Jew by the name of Bovarnik, who's up in Boston, who has um, come up with a new formula for creating rich sour cream. He doesn't have enough money to produce it himself, but he comes to Breakstone Brothers and offers to work for, for them. Um, they will hire him as their cheese uh, manufacturer or chemist. Uh, he will not share with them his formula, but they'll, they'll hire him and keep him gainfully employed. And Bovarnik begins to work on a new cream cheese that has increased fat content. Now remember, we said that Neufchatel was probably about 4% or so um, uh, milk fat. Okay? Cream cheese was about 6% milk fat. Okay, a nice appreciable difference. Bavarna creates a cheese that is 34% milk fat. Wow. It's like heroin. <laughs> <laughs> Huh. It hits the market in 1923. It's known as Downsville cream cheese, and its um, uh, title is the cream of cream cheeses. <laughs> Indeed, the, the reviewers and tasters who, who taste this flip out over this. Okay, they're just, it's, I mean, it, uh, look, uh, here's the parallel for us so you can understand this. We all grew up on ice cream. And then at some point, you remember when haagen came out, right? It was like, holy cow, that's right. I mean, it was it, right, rich and sugary and really bad for you, and but 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 absolutely stupendous. Okay, that's what that's what the Breakstone Brothers cream cheese was, was like, and Breakstone Brothers begin peddling this to the Jews of New York at precisely the time that we are now in a second generation of immigrant families. We're in the 1920s now, okay? Second generation of families, income has risen, costs of cheese production have begun to fall, and so by 1923, notice it's sort of all the same Lawrence factors again. The right, the right technology, the right taste, right? Um, um, and, and the affordability all at the same time. So by 1923, when Downsville cream cheese comes out, you have a Jewish community that now for the first time can afford it. You have a cream cheese that's more affordable and you have a taste that'll knock your socks off. Mm -hmm. And thus Brinkstone Brothers, while they did not invent cream cheese, are absolutely responsible for seeing to it that it got distributed um, to the Jews of New York, and soon after it starts to, uh, they start to spread their network going really as far as the Midwest. Now you can get Breakstone out here in California, but, but really it's, a, it's, a, it's an East Coast uh, product. Um, in 1928, just five years after uh, producing the cream cheese, they are bought out by Kraft. Oh. Oh which maintains, maintained and continues to maintain the Breakstone name, created the character of uh, Sam Breakstone in these commercials, totally made up character if you've ever seen the commercials on TV, um, but, uh, but it passed really out of the family hands by, by 1928. Uh, all right, so now we're almost there at the end of our story. We now have, for the first time, Jews enjoying cream cheese. By the way, the next impact Breakstone's cream cheese has on New York City life is the invention of cheesecake. <laughs> cheesecake up to then is being made with different types of farmer cheese that's sweetened. And now, what can you stuff in, in, in a cheesecake but 
34% fat Brinkstone Brothers cream cheese. And Absolutely. now all the recipes begin to change. I'm By the man, how are they using cream cheese? How are consumers using cream ah, cheese? Ah, up to this point, they were using it like brie. In other words, you spread it on crackers, on small pumpernickel rounds for your uh, lunch and soiree. Um, uh, it, that, that's how it started. By the 1920s, it's now affordable enough that the recipe books that up to now simply say, take cottage cheese or farmer's cheese, are now starting to say, take cream cheese. Okay. Jewish cookbooks, especially uh, Kendall's uh, The Settlement uh, Cookbook, some of you are familiar with it, you look through it endlessly, no recipes for cream cheese. Hasn't happened yet. But by the 20s, cream cheese is starting to become a more, how should we put it, ubiquitous cheese. And recipe books all over America, which first started as upper, again, upper class recipe books, now as it starts to seep down into the middle class and even in the beginning of the lower class, we find cream cheese used in, in cooking um, recipes. All right, so now we've got the Jews using cream cheese in the 20s. So a quick word now on lox and bagels. Yeah. Now, by the 1920s, lox has also flooded the Lower East Side of New York. It's coming from the Pacific Ocean here, and it's being shipped in refrigerated cars on railroad lines to New York. And there in New York, by the way, oftentimes it is smoked. Um, there are, Brooklyn is filled with smoke houses, uh, to take that on. Um, Lox is quite plentiful on the Lower East Side. Let's see, we've got bagels, we got, I'm um, sorry, we have cream cheese, we got lox, we're missing the bagel. And here's the problem. <laughs> the bagel is the worst vehicle for cream cheese that you can imagine. <laughs> it's got a hole in the middle. <laughs> Who in their right mind? Oh, I got a good idea. Let's take a piece of bread, punch a hole in the middle, and then attempt to put something across the top. It was, the bagel was never, ever meant for cream cheese. In Eastern Europe, by the way, we had a little bit of smoked fish. And when we do, what happened is we took a piece of pumpernickel bread, right? Maybe some rye, and we put a, a schmear of butter on it. And then we put the piece of fish. In America, what we would do is we would take a pumpernickel, fry, same thing, butter, piece of fish. When cream cheese comes along and is affordable by the American Jewish community, what were they doing? They were taking pumpernickel rye, putting a smear of cream cheese, and then their piece of lox. With me so far? Perfect sense. There's no hole in the middle. So how does it get combined? And here I am, now I move from history to sheer speculation, <laughs> because I will tell you frankly, the, the, the real historical answer is we don't know, we never will know, but we can make, I think, some educated guesses. Remember, as I said before, the first mention of cream cheese, bagels, and lox is not until uh, about 45, okay? <clears throat> so why and what's going on? By 1945, not all, but an enormous chunk of the Jewish community has left the Lower East Side of New York. Right? They have moved uh, over to Brooklyn. Uh, they've moved up to Trendy Harlem. Uh, uh, a few have made the journey out to Long Island, which is sort of like, you know, people used to live like in Agoura. It was like that too, like a wasteland out there, right? Um, but a lot of Jews have left the Lower East Side of New York. And for the second generation Jewish community, those who grew up on the Lower East Side as children of immigrants and had now left it, the Lower East Side becomes a locus for nostalgia. It becomes that vision of the good old days the old neighborhood. Clearly, Russia is never gonna, we're never gonna look with <laughs> fondness there, but they look with fondness to the Lower East Side. Um, uh, people are still, by the way, going down to the Lower East Side for the garment district deals, that's happening, and at times, to go get real Jewish food, like I remember growing up. Right? 
Somewhere along the line, somewhere soon after World War II comes to an end, someone, either a bigwig politician, a local deli, or, or something, throws some type of breakfast luncheon, and the, um, uh, the draw is, come and have food like we used to eat on the Lower East Side. And there on the spread is all the food that we used to eat on the Lower East Side. There's pumpernickel and rye bread and bagels and lox and cream <coughs> cheese and knishes and da, 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 da. And someone somehow, maybe a third generation, sees the bagels, sees the cream cheese and lox, and the two come together. That's my best guess as to what happened. Because as I said, no one in their right mind actually sat down and said, huh, let's put cream cheese on a bagel. What a great, what a great idea. No. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. All right, I think I've talked long enough. I'll take, uh, if there's any questions, uh, uh, I'll be happy to uh, entertain a few. Please. No questions, just a comment. Yes. I, I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. Yes. And in about 1940, 1942, yes. you could go into the deli downtown on Federal Street, which was a Jewish deli, and for 10 cents, they cut a slab of cream cheese in a bagel. And uh -huh. that was a very reasonable lunch because it was less than lunch meat. Okay, 49, 49, I'm with you. Notice, after 45. I'm, I'm hoping, of course, to be able to push back the date a little bit, I haven't found it yet, please. I'm an Irish Jew. <laughs> okay. My grandpa left Lithuania when he was 14, very young, young yeah. boy and ended up in Limerick, Ireland. Yeah, we yeah. still really don't quite know how. But, but my memory of cream cheese was something that was like a rare treat. Of course, that, this is way back in the, you Do you know. want to date yourself? <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> but, but way back. Yeah. And we would yeah. go to Clambrassel Street, which is the street with the Jewish shops in Dublin. Even we moved to Dublin from Limerick. And, and cream cheese, I remember, we would treat. shop and maybe twice, three times a year, you know, it wasn't a daily thing. Yes. And bagels I never knew from. No. Right, that makes perfect sense. And by the way, lox, when people remember, <laughs> um, uh, the older folks remember having lox uh, growing up, it's never the, 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 the 12 pieces of lox that we pile on, yeah. on stuff today. It always was, it, it still was fairly expensive and, and everyone would get a little, you know, shriveled uh, for, you know, just to lay in, in the middle of the cream cheese. Hmm? A fliggle. A fliggle? A fliggle. A wing. Yeah, the way, and it had a little house at the end. It was, it was a thing. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, that was probably the least expensive part of the uh, of the cut, right? Absolutely. Good. I gotta go get Please. So, is there a difference between breakstones in Philadelphia today, in terms of the fat content? Um, no. No. But break brand, is brand, 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 brand. Um, everyone in New York knows the Breakstone brand. That's why Kraft has, has held on to it. Um, um, and of course, the Philadelphia brand is famous. No, nope. it, it's always fascinating to me. You know, like we see TV commercials, like when, when they're sometimes showing one brand against another. We cleave. It turns out it's the same company owns both. You know, it, so no, no, Kraft, Kraft owns it all. You said the locks came from the West Coast. Yes. What about Nova? And that's all East Coast. So. Yes. So um, when did that happen? Um, I don't know. I, I actually don't. I don't know. You know, my, my special... You know, Article my, number five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not getting involved in locks, trust me. Please. Do you know when the big uh, bagel factory started in New York or the yeah. big stores? Yeah. More or less when? Oh, now bagels go way back. We can trace bagels back to Eastern Europe. Uh, we can trace bagels back uh, to some of the big cities in Poland were... Were so good as the ones from New York. Oh, you like the New York bagels? Yeah, I do. yeah. I, I, I met last night a guy um, who owns a cafe in San Francisco who wants to open up a, a bagel store, and he's convinced he can duplicate New York bagels. He said, it's not the water. He said, there's a definite way to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm, and he's, and he's yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, good luck. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all know there's no, New York bagels taste, it's the same thing with pizza, right? Yeah. Well, you know, New York pizza tastes different than LA pizza. 
Um, so, question. So, all right. So, Braystone and Craft, or Braystone and Philadelphia are the same. So, yeah. what happened? Did they reduce the milk? Did they reduce the fat in Braystone, or they increase the fat in Philadelphia? Because you said one had six percent, the other one had yeah, thirty-two yeah, okay. percent. Um, uh, so, what uh, did they do? Uh, <laughs> manufacturers uh, soon learned how to how to jack up the um, uh, the taste. So. Oh, the taste without increasing the no, fat. And the fat content. Right, so and the what fat is content. the fat content of Today? modern day cream cheese? Oh, I don't know. I don't have a clue. And what's in it? I can't tell you that either, right? I don't know. Oh, no, no. no. My, 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 my research really ends in 1928 when okay. Breakstone gets sold. We, so, we have, and we and have I really a, don't want to know what's in right. today's craft. <laughs> we have a tub in the back, I'll tell you. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll see. Good luck. <laughs> so, a real bagel is rolled out by hand and yes. pushed together, and yes. then it's Baked, boiled. boiled and then yes. baked. Well, and the guy who invented the machine that extrudes yes. bagels yes. like donuts died just, just a month died. ago. Yes. Oh. Yeah. 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 yeah, there was yeah, a great yeah. obit on it. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Right. Yeah. Talk a little bit about rennet milk. Oh, oh, the milk. Yes. oh, yeah. You're, oh, yes. we didn't talk about the milk meat right. issue, did we? No. Okay, so wait. Right? We know you can't mix milk and meat as Jews, right? right. But here is meat from the calf and it's being dropped into milk. How do we do that? Okay, so to begin with in the Orthodox world, um, all cheese made by non-Jews is not kosher. Let's start that way. Let's begin just in general. You can't eat cheese made by non-Jews. Um, second of all, um, uh, uh, and by the way, and the main reason for that, the main reason for it is there's worry about how the rennet is obtained. In other words, how was that calf slaughtered to get the, to then take out the stomach and, and get the rennet to begin with? And the answer is the calf was not slaughtered in a kosher way. Therefore, the calf meat is treif. It can't, it can't be used. And therefore, any cheese made from rennet of an improperly slaughtered calf isn't kosher. Okay. But now you say, okay, let's use Jewish slaughterers. Let's slaughter the calf in a kosher manner, no problem at all. Why do we still get to drop some meat into the milk? And it turns out that there is a Talmudic principle. <laughs> yeah. I gotta love those rabbis, right? right? That if the meat is less than 1 60th, of the milk it's being dropped into, it's a negligible amount and has no effect. Now, this is so that's the first reason. Second of all, today, um, a cheese is not curdled using rennet, it's curdled using enzymes, and enzymes are neither milk or fish or meat or God knows what they are. They're, they're, I don't know what enzymes are. They're enzymes. They're par. They're par. And therefore, we have no problem at all curdling milk. Um, uh, but in the days when all we had was the meat, it's less than 160. Oh, okay. Can can rennet be obtained from a pig's stomach? Because can what it be obtained from a pig's Because stomach? what I remember I growing know. up in New York mm, yeah. and coming from a kosher home yeah. and not being allowed to eat theoretically pizza is that the mozzarella cheese mm -hmm. was made with pig's rennet. Right. Oh, interesting. And that's what made it unkosher actually. Yeah, yeah, the question is, is there something called pig's rennet? I don't know. It's a great... I'll have to look and see if there's pig's rennet. I'm not sure. I thought that the less than 160th rule applied if it, if it fell in by accident. But that with the case of rennet, there was an issue because a dog wouldn't recognize it as being meat. Because it's not like taking... You don't take a piece of veal and stick it in, in, in it. You're taking this lining from the stomach that... Right. No, you know... Nobody would recognize his meat. Anyway, the dog no, would recognize it's not, but it's, his meat. No, no, in, in our day and age, it's, it, it now goes way beyond recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, the Orthodox authorities are pretty, uh, uh, pretty strict on that. There's a second way that get, gets you out of this a little bit, which is if it is not uh, used as, the, as a primary uh, material, but a secondary material, it's also being permitted if it's less than 1 60th. Okay. And there are those who have argued, yes, there are other curdling agents being put in. Um, uh, interestingly enough, the first company to advertise on their product that it was like kosher for Passover, et cetera, Breakstone. Breakstone. They knew their market. They were immediately going in for the, the Jewish market. And you can get them here. Yeah, you can get you can find breakstone products here in the in the shelves in some places, Carrie. I was wondering if uh, cream cheese 
Peaches like supplanted schmaltz in a large way. Kind of <laughs> uh, 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 anything uh, noticeable on like either increase or decrease in health issues? Yeah, that's interesting because as you know, schmaltz also is one of the things that was smeared on rye bread. Yeah. Is that interesting? Oh, yeah. I, you know what? But I never but with garlic. With garlic. Uh, All right. Now that's that's really interesting because I never thought about this. I I, I certainly don't have an answer of whether it's supplanted any. But how interesting, think about this, that, that we don't think about smearing schmaltz on bagels. No, no, no. We, right? No. Right? We smear it on the proper vehicle for it, which is which is rye bread. Right, right. Or pumpernickel. Or pumpernickel, right? My right. father grew up with, you know, talking about nothing but schmaltz. Yeah, 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 everything. And then, you know, my grandfather died at 45. <laughs> <laughs> but again, if if the bagel was the proper vehicle for the stuff, we'd have schmaltz spread on it as well. We didn't. So, but... You're asking again an interesting question about did then the um, uh, cream cheese in terms of if you have to smear something is that why is that why schmaltz starts to fall out of favor I don't know it is interesting isn't it people don't really use schmaltz much well it because it's horrible for them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think it's also because of the cholesterol it's what cholesterol oh the health issue yes yes that, that nasty health issue yeah yeah it's easier to eat what do you mean it's easy? I mean it's like making a sandwich, right? Why can't you make a schmaltz sandwich? It would fall no, off the yeah. That's more, maybe that's yes, more yes. It, the other the other thing I should mention about cream cheese over the years is it um uh, given the the way it's produced, uh, the companies do did have to start interjecting more and more stabilizers into it. Um, uh, the more uh, the more cream you have, the more unstable it is, and you start seeing advertisements for cream cheese made with vegetable gum added. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're often running into the brave new world of uh, food additives and everything else. All right, I think that should, that's plenty. We'll stop for today.